Good morning and welcome to the symposium Everyday Matters of Interaction Design. Welcome at the Eindhoven University of Technology. Welcome to the Department of Industrial Design. Um, we're celebrating this year 15 years of our department, 15 years old, 15 years young. Um, it's also, welcome to Dutch Design Week, also 15 years old. Um, today we have this symposium um, which comes together with the most important talk at the end of the day, the inaugural speech of Professor Ron Wakari. Um, chair, I still have to think about the name, read it out, Impact of Interaction Design on Everyday Life. Um, this chair is part of the group DQI, Designing Quality and Interaction, which is 10 years old this year. So there are plenty of reasons to celebrate. Usually when you go to conferences, you pick up three, maybe four good talks. Today, I think we have seven great speakers into one day. <laughs> this doesn't happen very often. Also, welcome to the people viewing from home or at a later stage downloading this symposium to watch it from home. The session, we have two sessions, one before the lunch, one after lunch, three speakers each, 20 minutes of talk, and then we have a discussion afterwards, so save your questions a bit for the discussion. I think we would like to start with our first speaker, Oscar Tomiko. Oscar is trained as an... <laughs> Oscar is trained as an industrial designer from Catalonia, Spain. He's a design researcher within our own DQI group and wearable sensors at our Department of Industrial Design. He has been project lead of a successful smart textile services project, part of CRISP, and also initiator of interesting projects like crafting wearables and the European Horizon 2020 Architects project. And today we'll be talking about soft wearables. Hello everybody. Seems I don't need to introduce myself anymore, so I will start right away. That gives me one minute more. So uh, today I'm going to talk about soft wearables and especially about designing products that are worn. And I'm going to start with a story. A story that it's about moving from close to the body to on the body interactions. So there's quite an interest in the last years on moving from handheld to body-worn devices to think about human garment interaction or uh, look at the wearability and social aspects of uh, garments. It's also interesting to see how people are starting to look at the body not just as a thing itself, but also in relation to the things that we are wearing. So I'm going to start the story with a project done in 2012. This project was coached by Stefan, and it was done by Paula Casanar at Philips Research. And it was making like a really light fabric, a light fabric that uh, could light up. And one can think that making a wearable is just putting it on your neck. And, well, my talk today is going to be about saying that, well, there is a bit more than that. So, and this is actually what happened. We started with just trying it on, on someone's body, exploring how light could reveal and hide parts of it. But suddenly we realized that we also want to be in control of it. We want to be able to turn parts on and off whenever we want it. And over time also, you don't, uh, uh, you don't want to use a mirror, you don't want to look at people's faces to realize if something is on or off. So we also move from light into uh, a more direct uh, mapping where vibration relates directly to touch. So you can feel the interaction rather than just having to look at it. In a way, what we realized is we had to move from the, the one functionality or two that products have to the multifunctionality that garments have. So it needs to be nice, it needs to look good, I need to be comfortable with it, etc., 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 etc. So, in so my take today is to say that actually designing soft wearables doesn't require new skills, and one could be quite um, surprised with this comment. And my answer is like, well, you don't do it alone, you don't do it with a group of people. So you, when you try to make like a smart shirt, like an interactive pillow, or whatever else you think could be uh, possible, 
uh, you do it together with others. You do it with electrical engineers, you do it with uh, textile designers, fashion designers, you do it with textile developers, with uh, service providers, etc., etc. So I would say that there is no need to know it all. You just need to be an expert on what you're good at and find the proper partners. But there is something that you do need and it's, it requires a new mindset. A new mindset that it's not either coming from fashion and it's not either coming from HCI. It's something different. And I think that's what I would like to talk about today. So I've been for the last year during my sabbatical traveling around and I've done a lot of workshops in New Zealand, in Sweden, in Catalonia, in Taiwan. And I'm gonna use these workshops, especially the one I did in New Zealand, as a case to make my point clear. <laughs> so, um, and I'm choosing this workshop also because it's done in the Creative Technologies uh, Bachelor and Master that they have at uh, Auckland University of Technology, which is an interesting place because they already com combine game design, interaction design, fashion design, textile design, all in one place. So I didn't need to, to teach them all the skills. As I said before, they could collaborate with each other to make it happen. So especially this workshop was about exploring slow and fast on the body interactions. More specifically, it was exploring how vibration or heat could make garments more com could make you more comfortable, healthy, or happy. So in a way, it was about exploring well-being as a new layer of luxury in garments. The way that I always do workshops is by taking a lot of photos and always asking people the day after, how did the last day go? So what did we do? What did we learn? To always reflect on it. And I do that in order to, in a way, smooth out the frictions that happen. So today what I'm gonna talk is about these frictions. So during three days in Auckland, we've been exploring how we behave. We've been trying out and role playing. We've been like looking at production with felt. We've been trying to integrate heat parts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Till the point that we end up with these beautiful two garments. But this was not easy. We had a lot of problems. We had a lot of things that didn't work, especially when you try to put people from different disciplines together. I would say that this is a list of some of the things that happened, some of the frictions, these kind of uh, dilemmas that people had to deal with. My point here would be that we need to go beyond them. Uh, most of them also has this negative content, this negative um, positioning. So, as a designer, do I want to wear my own clothes? I'm more interested in crafts or technology. What is more important, function or aesthetics? Do, do I believe in representations or not? So I think that it's really important to try to go beyond them and not as a, an academic exercise, but also uh, in practice. If, we, if with these people we wanted to end up with some interesting results, we had to overcome them. So what I'm gonna show you is actually that. I'm gonna show you how we try to overcome them, how we try to go beyond them. So, I don't know, maybe someone else can uh, use it. Let's start with the first one. I mean, they're quite cliche in a way, but well, that's what I could come up with in a few days. This is a new presentation, I just made it up in the, next day, in the last day, so. So the first point, it's, it's a typical one in terms of as a designer, do I want to wear my own clothes? Am I interested? I mean, you can design for elderly care or you can design for other contexts that you're own, but how involved are you in the process? So it's really easy to start observing and reflecting on your own personal behavior, on your body movements in everyday activities. And you can start ideating on how you can use heat and vibration over the body, but the challenge is then when everybody's looking at you and you have to actually say, yeah, this is still me, this is still the person behind. So I think that would be good to look at it from the perspective of the intentionality that the garment has and the dialogue that it creates between people. So I think it's interesting to look at uh, the agency as a of the material from a first person perspective. So it's interesting that you, by wearing it, you can feel not just how the garment 
behaves, but also how the people around you behaves. If they are smiling, if they are looking at you like in a strange way. And I think that this is really something really important. But let's move to the other ones. Another point, also a bit cliche, craft versus technology. It feels, uh, again, something that we all have overcome, but you, I still get all these questions like, okay, but how many sensors do I need to use? Does it need to also do this? And does it need also do something else? In the workshop, we started by being super preci precise and uh, like an, from an engineering perspective, like measuring the portions that conductive wool should have with natural wool in order to create felt. But then we ditched all these things and we start working with like uh, hand looms. We start working with the uh, machines there because they could create a quality that we couldn't get if we were just like measuring things. So I think the interesting thing is to look at not like crafts or technology, but just transformations of the material and how can we step them one next to each other. So we can use these, um, we can use like traditional um, uh, tools in order to, for example, align the fibers, which then later on we put on the industrial felting loom. Another interesting one is how we relate function and aesthetics. You do? <laughs> anyway, um, so the typical question I get sometimes from, fun uh, from fashion designers or from uh, artists is like, does it need to be functional? As if it's like the antichrist. Um, so in this workshop, we started really looking just at the statics first, like being super impressed with how you could connect things when you're working with felt, uh, trying to see combinations of colors. But then when we were working with the heat pads, then suddenly it was all about layers, construction, integration, which is a different story. I think that when we start looking at these materials from its, their qualities, from what they could do, then we could actually explore new things. So we could make touch sensors that tickle, that look like some, that has this kind of silvery gold kind of take on it. Another point that for me is really important is the relation between thoughts, material, body, and context. I'm the first person that if I see someone just drawing or just talking, I say stop and start playing with it. But is that the only way to do it? So um, in a way, I, I realize that it's important to conceptualize. I realize that it's important to know. But do we need to know first? Do we need to know it all? Also, it's really difficult when you work with electronics to move it from, from the table. The table is really powerful. Everything works on the table. But if you move it from it, then it stops. But what if we look at the relations, I think, can we, so can we look at how a material on the body behaves while you are talking to someone in the moment, blah, 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 blah. So how does it feel? How does felt feel when pressing it to your neck while you talk? So can we combine all this together? Then an interesting point also, especially when working with wearables, if we work with an direct or indirect mapping between input and output. The question of like, is it working? And now is it working? If I move my hand a bit up, it, will it work now? These are questions that I get all the time. And I think that some of them come by separating these different fields. So like a typical common is like, for now I will use a potentiometer to check how we can make the heating pad work. So completely forgetting about what the input will be. Or the other way around, like, am I developing the right sensor for a specific body action? And, well, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but at least I know that I can get the data I need. I think that if we look at more from the perspective of material interactivity, then if it's like um, direct or indirect, it doesn't matter. It will depend on what, how the material behaves. So I think that an interactive material to be could start by being a collection of things. And little by little, it will inform each other and it will end up in a way that makes sense. Another point that I'm interested in is the relation between representation and expression. You know that in, in DQI we are really about expressions and we are not really happy with 
representations in a way. But, and that's why I put this, this uh, question. Uh, so like, is it blue the warmest color? I don't know. So um, I'm interested in a way to let the material talk and let the form emerge from the interaction with the body. But I know a lot of people that they, they are inspired by culture, they are inspired by uh, society, and they use that as a way of tackling a specific target group, a specific group of society. So I think the challenge is how we can combine the representations, the expression all together and, and just try to make things meaningful. So I think that bodily expressions do relate to culture and reading them depends on the social group you belong to. I think that most of you know about this, so it just, this is a quote, this is some thoughts that I had. And finally, I also want to talk about the relation between open and closed use and fit. So another question that I always get is, uh, is this the right way to use it? And the mine, my answer is, is there a right way? So in one of the projects, which they were really trying to have this kind of a uh, Japanese look, they were, it was the material, it was the, um, the garment that was telling us the way to wear it. In other cases, it's the other way around. Actually, the concept was based on that it could be used upside down and inside out. So you could do whatever you want with it. For me, I think that it's important to look about how the material is appropriated, how is it gonna be uh, developed, and I think that this personalization, appropriation, is a matter of being open for dialogue. A bit of like a dialogue between the designer, the material, the user, all together. So this is what I wanted to talk about. I mean, these words are just annotations, so please don't take them Seriously, I know that most of you know how to do this better than me, but it's also, um, it's also a way of um, posting my uh, reflections from practice, and I hope that it's also a start for some discussions later on. Thank you. take it off the table and on the street. Um, what other ways do you see has changed a focus on the everyday for what you are doing? I think also if you look at these projects, none are, none are professional tools. So these are jackets, these are like um, garments that you should be able to use to go to work, to go home, or to even to be around. So for me it's the um, it's it relates to the multiple uh, uses, the multiple uh, goals that these garments have. So it needs to be comfortable, it needs to be uh, look good on you, it needs to relate to the people that you want to be seen with. And I think these are things that, um, from a product perspective, are not that easy to tackle. So I think that by, um, when you design like on the body interactions, you think that actually you make your life easier because it's smaller. It's like a little thing here, but actually it's way, way more complicated. Does it answer your question? And how is it more complicated? <laughs> and how would you, what advice would you give to overcome that complexity? I think that it's more complicated because it's not anymore um, like a product, it's you. So it's the same as you, and if you have a little bump on your shoulder, you have a little bump of your shoulder. If your phone or whatever screen ends up on, on front of your face, you look like stupid. So there's, there are things that you, um, as a product designer, that you are not aware of. As a product designer, you like um, to make the, the product easy to use, but you don't want to live your life easy. You want to be in control of your life. Um, you don't want to use a jacket in just one way. You don't want to use it with just one t-shirt. And I think it's this openness, openness to take it with you, to make it your own. That's something that you normally don't do with a glass of water or you don't do with a computer. Does this work? I can move this to the front. <laughs> Question. Maybe, yeah, now it works, this would help. 
I thank you, Oscar. So I just have a very simple question. When you look at that list you have at the end, hmm. uh, would that be a different list if it was not about this particular area of particular material and craft or? I don't know. Is it? Oh, you don't know. Okay. <laughs> I think that that's a bit like, um, might be the next step. I, I like uh, to work on wearables because it's an extreme case. So by being an extreme case on how you can combine societal issues with like more material performance and so I would argue that by being extreme case, it might embrace or like cover most of the points that other objects or other fields of design could have, but that's just a supposition. Did the list surprise you or? Okay. I think it's a, an, obvious, an obvious list though. But, uh, it's an obvious list, but often the, the, the focus is um, not always balanced. And, and indeed, if, well, our experience, if we work together with, with fashion designers, um, the notion of functionality is totally different from when interaction designer approaches functionality. Same goes for aesthetics. Mm. So I think indeed the balance is, uh, I mean, if we all take this list into account, then I think the world will be <laughs> much more livable, um, but yet the focus is different, especially when working with different disciplines. But I think it's also a trick to avoid using loaded words, although these ones are loaded too, <laughs> but anyway. Is there another question? And perhaps Will can already set his computer up. Uh, thank you, Oscar. I, I really enjoyed your uh, presentation and your reflections because this is what we need. We, we try a lot to play with wearables, but uh, for example, from my experience, it's very difficult to uh, think about scenarios for, uh, you know, where you can reasonably uh, use wearables. And uh, for, from my uh, experience, for example, the best scenario that uh, I had in a recent workshop in Siena was something that was very functional. So the idea of wearing a jacket that lights up uh, when you bike in, during the night to to uh, to show the intention not to turn. Okay, and this was the best that that we can that we could have. But you showed a lot of uh, you reflected on uh, qualities, appropriation, uh, and so forth that I find very interesting. But did you also find a way to support people in uh, you know reflecting at this level? Uh, so trying to uh, yeah, to, 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 to manifest, to verbalize, to, uh, to communicate these subtleties of, uh, you know, wearing this kind of uh, technologies and that would be very interesting to know. Yeah, uh, well, normally yes, because what I do, it's, especially if I work with people that have never done things like this before, what we work is just on a redesign of one of their own objects or their own garments. In this way, they can reflect on how working with new materials transforms their practice and also transforms their identity. So that's my trick. My trick is to use a, something that they already have done before, so they feel comfortable, and they can really compare the new design with the old one, and they can see the difference between them. Okay, thank you, Oscar. Next speaker is Will Odom. Will is human computer interaction design researcher and currently based at the School of Interactive Arts and Technology at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. Um, he held the Banting Fellowship, which is one of the world's most prestigious international research fellowships. But the one that we think is the most prestigious is the one that is offered by Design United. <laughs> the visit, the, the visiting research fellow, and that brought you already twice to uh, to Eindhoven University in a collaboration with uh, Delft and Twente. Um, and I would like to give you the floor. Um, thanks very much. It's, so I'm very excited to be here and be able to contribute to this event and the ongoing discussions we'll be having today. And special thanks to Design United for supporting the uh, the ongoing kind of exchanges that I've had here. 
So today I want to talk about this idea of slow interaction design, um, but before getting into that, I want to kind of give a, a bit of context around what's kind of motivating this work and where it's coming from. So we know that we're living in a world today where people are able to rapidly create, store, share, and archive um, digital content at scales larger and rates faster um, than ever before in human history. And so these new technologies have enabled people to create vast collections of digital materials that capture their life experiences. And so I think everyone within this room has the experience of seeing this as being a very valuable resource for connecting with others, um, and also for remembering and reflecting on our own lives and social relationships. Um, and so one thing that's clear is that digital technology is increasingly mediating people's everyday practices of capturing and reflecting on their life experiences. And it's really critical from a design perspective that we start to understand this shifting trend. Um, and so one trend that we're seeing is that our, as our everyday technologies are increasingly becoming networked and connected, there's been an exponential rise in the production and consumption of personal digital data. Um, so just as an example, according to a 2004 white paper, there's now 21,000 photos uploaded per second to social media sites around the world. So just to give some context, that's 25.2 million photos that will be uploaded just in the time that my presentation will take. So it's really this kind of staggering scale, right? And, and the fact that in 2015, over one trillion songs were streamed from online music streaming services. I mean, this is it's just this, this, this incredible, almost um, hard to, to even take into account um, orders of magnitude. And so this is just kind of the world that we're thrown into, right? And so it presents incredible opportunities to record our life experiences in more precise and exacting detail than ever before. Um, but these shifts are also leading to experiences of losses of kind of control or even kind of awareness over, over where our things are and kind of what they're doing to us. And so we're really starting to see um, the effects of this uh, within interaction design and beyond. And so in terms of people increasingly struggle, struggling with an inability to manage the overload of personal digital data they're producing and encountering. And this is, this is resulting in a diminished capacity for digital content to, to support activities like reflection and meaning making among several other undesired effects. And these tensions are really only going to become more complex and systemic for future generations. And so it starts to raise this question around, well, what kind of future are we creating? But beyond just our relation to digital data, when we start to think about the amount of things that are being produced, it also leads us to really consider the technologies that are manifesting these things too. When our relation to them is only their utility, as they become slower or less operational, then they really, um, they, like, they have a very ephemeral place in our lives. And so scholars like Enzio Manzini and the Dutch Design Collective, Eternally Yours, and even Peter Paul Verbeek, and many others have argued that it's essential that we move from making just devices or products to really critically thinking about how we can create things that might have a longer lasting significance in our lives and maybe contribute to a more durable material culture. So this starts to raise some really interesting and big questions for interaction design. These questions around, well, how will digital media archives be meaningfully experienced as they grow to this kind of size and scale that we've never previously encountered? Or how can we enable computational things to have a longer term, term place or operate as longer term resources in everyday life? Um, and really kind of from a design perspective, what are the kinds of considerations we should take into account in pursuing these really kind of complex design issues? Um, so these questions are really kind of venturing into somewhat of like largely the unknown and there's never going to be kind of like one solution to them, right? Um, but within my work and, and working with many other colleagues, we've been really drawn towards um, the slow technology design philosophy as a way of kind of framing research and kind of activity within this area. And so very, very simply put, slow technology offers, um, argues for creating technology that surrounds us and is a part of our activities over a long period of time, just kind of very simply put. And so in the context of this talk, I want to talk about and really just kind of provide brief glimpses into three different projects that um, I've worked on with, with a number of, of colleagues that, that start to kind of flesh out this idea or explore this idea of what, what slow interaction design might be. And so before getting into these, um, these projects, I want to just kind of preface that, that each of these projects has kind of this, this, a sense of design qualities that, that spans, goes across them. And so um, it's, it's, it, across them it has this idea of creating technology that, that does not require nor demand the attention of its owner in order to kind of um, do its function or operation. 
And in this way, it aims to kind of leave it up to people to then decide if they want to engage with these kind of things in everyday life or kind of go about the, their, their everyday lives um, uh, with them. So the first project I just want to kind of give a glimpse into is the Photobox project. Um, and so one thing that I do want to point out is that good kind of design and design research doesn't happen in isolation. And so I really want to acknowledge the foundational role, especially that Mark Selby played in envisioning this concept, and also um, Richard Banks and Abigail Sellen, as well as Dave Kirk and, and Tim Reagan, um, as playing a, a key parts in, in pursuing this research project. So again, coming back to photos, so with now 678 billion photos being uploaded every year, people are, are accumulating so many digital photos that their archives are becoming impenetrable. And so this really threatens the digital photos collection's ability to operate as an everyday resource for reflection. So in our project, the photo box really aimed to be a disruptive technology that was really targeting the consumption of digital photos. So not the production, but the consumption. And so kind of simply put, it's a domestic technology that occasionally prints a randomly selected photo from its owner's Flickr collection. So there's two main components. Uh, the first is an oak chest. And so here um, we decided on using a chest that had gathered this kind of healthy amount of patina as it might project a sense of endurance or maybe even something that precious things could be kept inside of. And the second material is a Bluetooth connected printer. Um, this was housed within a case that was then put into the upper part of a chest. And so this is kind of an upper panel where the printer was hidden from the, uh, the owner. And so essentially this is a view of the chest opened up. Um, and so the important thing to know about the, the photo box is that it randomly selects four or five photos each month from its owner's Flickr collection and then randomly prints them throughout that month. And so it's, it makes it impossible to anticipate when a photo will be printed um, and which one will be printed. And so the, the owner has no control actually over the photo box. And so the main interaction is going to the chest, opening it up and seeing if there's a photo from your past waiting for you or not. And so some of the things that we wanted to explore with this is how slowness might open up a space for anticipation over time, how it might shape people's kind of relation to their digital photo collection, but also kind of importantly, how it might open a dialogue with people about their perceptions of living with a slow technology, something that really kind of contrasted um, qualities that we see in contemporary technology design for the home. Um, so we deployed three photo boxes simultaneously in three different households for 14 months. Um, and so each household had a FLIR account of, of thousands of photos and then we kind of conducted interviews over the course of this time to really kind of just track people's experiences and open up these kind of discussions with them. And so I don't want to go into too many of the findings in the context of this presentation, but just to give you a sense for some of the, the, the reactions that we saw. Um, early on, there was definitely a tension across households about this kind of slower printing rate. And just to give one voice to this, um, this participant says, well, when it did print, I'd get excited, but also kind of tense. I'd be like, when's the next one coming? What's it going to be? When should I look next? Why is it doing this to me? And so then he continued on by saying, well, I'm so used to seeing photos on the internet, just clicking through them rapid fire, it became hard to wait. So in another case, um, here, Heather also kind of remarking on the photo box says, well, even though it's using a laptop and getting on my Flickr, I had to let go of any idea that it's like any of our other gadgets. It's not too typical I have to wait for technology. That took time to get used to. Um, but over time, the photo box tended to become accepted and slowness appeared to help kind of grow anticipation around interacting with it. Um, we also found that photos became more reintroduced into people's everyday lives in an ongoing basis and they were meaningfully integrated into the home. Um, but really in the context of this presentation, I just want to reflect back on a few examples of participants kind of broader, broader reflections of living with slow technology. And so just these two different examples I'm going to use were from um, the interview that was conducted at the very end, so after 14 months of living with this, this thing and, and, and some reflections on, on what it was like and some comparisons. So here Tim says, well, sometimes I'm overrun. The sound of the TV and my phone, texts and notifications. It's creative and getting away from all this. I like how it's a technology, but it does stuff in a simple way. It wasn't yelling at me. And so here Britt says, well, it's in the backdrop of our life, not distracting just there, like many of the things we keep out on the mantle or put up on the wall. 
And so really what I wanted to kind of remark on here in terms of some broader implications and kind of for the concept of this presentation, kind of ignoring what the design implications or design opportunities were, but really just kind of to, to point out that the photo box provoked participants to examine their technological practices, not just with it, but kind of beyond it and kind of think about how technologies were shaping their lives in other ways. Um, also, it was accepted this, as this kind of background technology that could be closed up um, and kind of fade into the background relatively easily, but then also be encountered and opened up and engaged with. And so um, this started to open an opportunity for thinking about kind of developing out a theory and practice of slow interaction design or kind of developing this conceptual construct further. So the second project that I want to talk about actually emerged out of a module that Ron Wakarian and I taught um, at TUE in, in industrial design. Um, and so this project was done by our students, Jeroen Hull, Brown Naus, and Pepin Verberg. Um, and so I think this, is, this project really is a testament and an illustration of the great design and design research that comes out of, of TUE. And together we're now working on, on kind of developing it into like a longer term project. But just to give you an idea of, of the concept that came out of this work. So the OLLI project is really starting to, to explore kind of shifting relationship to music. So music used to be something that we not only consumed, but we really kind of lived with over time, right? It was a part of our lives. It was something that we would curate, that we would kind of interact with, that we would directly listen to. Um, but it was really often a, a reflection of um, our evolving sense of self and tastes and preferences. Um, and it really was a part of our kind of domestic material culture, right? But today, this is often, not always, this is often what our music experience kind of looks like and our engagement with music. And so this movement to cloud streaming music services has enabled us to have nearly like any music that we want at our fingertips with very precise histories of what we've listened to and when. And this is great. This is not to say this is bad. It's kind of the world that we're living in now. But what we do know about this is that it's kind of changed the way that we possess our music, our relation to it, and also the way we might curate it and the way we might live with it. And so Ali is a networked music player that is connected to its owner's Spotify account that occasionally surfaces songs from its owner's past. So really kind of leveraging the, this, this kind of deeper background history that we have captured. And so when Ali surfaces a song, this internal disc will begin to rotate. And so um, as the speed, of the, the, the speed of the rotation is directly tied to how deep into the past the song was last listened to. So the slower um, the rotation is, the deeper into the past it was last listened to, and, and vice versa. And so it will rotate 20 times and then abandon the song if, if, if it hasn't been engaged with. But if the, the owner decides to play it, it can be played by kind of rotating the disc. Um, and so I'll just play a video to, to help kind of um, unpack this experience. Um, but one thing I'll, I'll point out as this is kind of starting up is, uh, is that, oh, it looks like, oh, blast. Well, we'll see if we can. Uh... So, so now it's rotating. And this speed would probably indicate not too far into the past. So another key design detail that I want to point out is that um, Ollie is kind of mirrored on both sides. So it can be reconfigured and played and, and engaged with in any kind of uh, situation. And so uh, over time it could be kind of embedded into the domestic environment in different ways. And so one of the key things though that I wanted to point out um, following from this video is that it really highlights how Ollie can kind of continue to change as its owner's music listening histories kind of change over time. And this way it represents a computational object that can evolve and change with its owner, but not necessarily kind of doing so in a way that requires its owner to do anything. It kind of subtly evolves independently. And so the last project I want to talk about is uh, the Slow Game Project, which is done with Aishrek Bertrand, uh, Garnett Hertz, Henry Lin, and Mac Harkness. 
So the slow game project draws inspiration from how people used to play chess over the mail. So you may live with your chessboard in your home for many months awaiting to get a letter informing you of your opponent's next move, right? And so it was something that you would interact with slowly over time, so like the chessboard that you're living with, um, that you could maybe look at and reflect on when you're thinking about when the, when the letter is coming to you, or you could just go about your day and completely ignore it. It was just kind of this, this facet that was within your home. So we were really interested in applying this metaphor um, to a fast-moving game. And in this case, we chose one that has a kind of a strong place within popular culture history. And so um, the snake game was on many, many phones, but especially this particular Nokia handset in the mid-90s that was widely produced. Um, it's like one of the largest produced mobile phones ever. And the snake game was a very fast game. So you could play it very, like several times just while you were waiting for the bus. It was this really kind of mundane thing, but it has a particular place within popular culture. And so if you're not familiar with how it works, I'll play just a really short video and kind of just to give you a demonstration of how it typically operates. Okay, so the snake is just moving around and it's, it's, it's looking after this like one pixel thing that's the food as it gets it, it grows longer and longer and longer. And the challenge is you don't want to run into yourself or you die, or if you run into a wall, you die. Very simple game. That's it. There's nothing else to it, right? And so, in the context of our work, we really want to just use this as a metaphor for making a very simple, kind of low-level, slow, interactive thing. And kind of think about, well, where would that push us? And so, after doing some kind of lower-level prototyping, thinking about the form, we then moved on to think about kind of materials and what would, what would be a kind of a slower process. And so one really slow process is by scavenging our own wood from a fallen tree that, that came down in a windstorm and then sealing it up with beeswax and drying it out and then starting to process it and then milling the, the wood cases for the electronics to include inside of it and then cutting our own veneer from that same tree and then eventually using that as the front facing plate after a lot of sanding and uh, working with the materials. But the point is that, that the, the slow game really ended up being this like incredibly simple artifact. So there's no interface and the user can orient the snake's direction in pursuit of the food that it's hunting um, just simply by rotating the cube. Just, it's very, very simple. Um, so here you can see that the user can control where the next move will go. So here it's retracing. Okay, and now it's, it's blinking, and that indicates where the next move will go, but it's not going to go there. That's just where it will go. You can rotate it again, that's going to change the orientation. This, this, in this instance, it's pointing further away from, from the food that it is eventually trying to get to. So, the snake game um, will make a move about every 18 hours. And so the snake will continue to move each day within this time frame. If it loses battery power, it's going to remember exactly where it was and continue to proceed until the owner loses the game or if they win, which would take approximately six to eight months, maybe one year. And so the, really the point here though is that time continues to pass through it no matter what. It can never be paused. It just continues to move. And so this is a really simple and somewhat even absurd computational thing, but, but really what I want to draw attention to it because it's so simple, it actually makes some things very transparent, right? So through its real and actual existence, it really pushes us to consider what might be opened up by designing computational things that by their very nature require interactions to take place within a broader temporal scale. So in this case, um, you may be able to plan an action, but you can't fully control it and it will take time for it to unfold. So now just in conclusion, I want to kind of just build on this kind of last statement and in general the, these kind of glimpses into these different projects and come back to these artifacts to briefly note three qualities that we can see start to surface um, from these slow interaction design things. So all of these artifacts don't demand their owner's attention in order to operate. So they offer invitations for people to engage with them on their own terms, but they're not necessarily kind of demanding or requiring anything from their owner. Um, and so in this way, they're not force-fitting themselves into, say, a prescribed place or a predetermined use in people's lives. So they continue to evolve without requiring the user's attention, and they have the capacity to open up kind of these emergent encounters um, as experiences with them accumulate over time in, in people's everyday lives. And so they really have this capacity to kind of evolve slowly with people, but not really need anything from them in order to have this evolution. Um, and, and finally, 
kind of ironically, slow interaction really pushes us to expand our thinking beyond designing only for interaction and moving towards creating computational things that can be embedded in a wider range of experiences and practices and encounters over time where interaction might only be one kind of dimension of that experience. Um, and so really in conclusion, what I want to say is that we all know that there's a need to support a longer term, more meaningful way of living and being with the computational things that we're creating and we're introducing into the world. Um, there's never going to be one solution or strategy to solve this problem, but through these glimpses, I hope it's helped give a picture of what slow interaction design might be and how it could be one of many strategies to combat this issue. So thanks for my many collaborators. <laughs> Thanks, Will. Uh, yeah. You nicely filled your time, so we'll leave the questions for the discussion. And then I would like to uh, uh, invite the next speaker to set up. Our next speaker is Jung Gyang Lim. She's an associate professor at industrial design at KAIST, Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. Um, in my opinion, she wrote some very strong papers on prototyping and interaction gestalt and aesthetics of design, which I often give to my students as the necessary must read for interaction design. So I'm very happy that you are here to talk about redefining user experience design for HCI 3.0 artifacts. Thank you very much. I'm so um, honored to hear <laughs> that your students are referring to my papers. And also, I'm very excited to be part of this wonderful event. I really also congratulate Ron and also the community here in this department. And I also, I'm very honored to be here, here as well. Uh, in this talk, I would like to um, kind of um, uh, propose or kind of emphasize that uh, there is a need for us to rethink about the uh, current user experience design paradigm as we start to face uh, many of the newly emerging interactive and computational artifacts like IOTs or wearables and many you know smart and intelligent uh, service and applications which I start to call them as HCI 3.0 artifacts. And I think that uh, these newly emerging artifacts show some kind of uh, very new kind of natures and characteristics comparing to tr traditional international uh, interactive artifacts. So um, as a designers, we need to understand what are the nature of these kind of artifacts and how to support designers to uh, design these kind of artifacts more valuable and effective for people. So these are some um, examples kind of, of famous popular examples which can be categorized as uh, HCI 3.0 artifacts. Uh, probably you know many of these already. Uh, if we take a look at like a uh, example like a nest, um, the, uh, it's a thermostat, but it's not the traditional thermostat at all. Uh, with a traditional thermostat, if we set a certain temperature, we expect that the uh, uh, environment will go to that temperature that we set. Uh, so it has a very simple functionality and fixed and well-defined functionality. But with the nest, actually the goal is not uh, exactly to set the temperature the user uh, set in the uh, thermostat. Actually, the, it has a bigger, role, uh, bigger goal uh, in this system, which is to save energy. So to save energy, actually, the features and functionality is not just fixed to the uh, setting to the right uh, temperature, but or temperature, but also provide a lot of different kinds of functionalities and services, not even the users uh, imagined or expected. And also the examples like IFTTT, probably many of, of you already know, um, uh, which, through which we can create many different kinds of uh, new features and functionalities uh, by ourselves as end users. So when we are usually traditionally um, using this kind of uh, interactive applications, uh, there are a set of well-defined um, functionalities that can provide. But with this kind of artifacts, actually, users are not controlling or interactive predefined functionalities, but users are creating their own functionalities. And also the examples like uh, Amazon Echo uh, agent-based devices or the wristband uh, smart watches, uh, they are collecting our data and also pro start to produce services that are not just uh, coming from individual well-defined uh, 
uh, artifacts, but they are connected to other things and try to increase many different services, which we will not know what to come even next. So the, the phenomena of these kind of artifacts start to show us that, that there seems to be no particular well-defined boundary of the usage space that they, these kind of artifacts can provide for us. So this is actually very challenging for designers as we are more um, accustomed to design something with a well-defined usage space and try to you know, the, make them un understandable and well-defined through our forms and things like that. So um, our lab has been very much interested in how to you know, understand this kind of newly emerging uh, paradigm of the artifact and how to help uh, designers to uh, design these kind of things more meaningful and effective and valuable for people. So in this talk, I would like to um, introduce two research cases that our lab has been working on. And as one example, uh, we um, were interested in this kind of phenomena having uh, not really well-defined usage space uh, in terms of the artifacts that are produced nowadays. And so, in a few years ago, um, led by one of my PhD students, uh, Jim Min Seok, uh, who is now uh, finishing uh, her thesis now, uh, has, we have proposed this uh, new design space called non-finito products, which are basically uh, designed to be intentionally unfinished so that actually the kind of emptying or opening up a part of the product which can be, uh, which is not finished or defined by the designers, but which can be decided and completed by users themselves so that we can foster their uh, end users' creativity in the use of this kind of product in their personal living situation. So um, the term non-finito was not the actually new term that we com came up with. It's actually used for art domain uh, even since 14 centuries, a long time ago. Um, that the artists were very um, uh, engaged. Uh, they came up with the, the technique called non finito technique since um, the Renaissance era uh, with famous artists like Donatello, Michelangelo, and Leonardo da Vinci. I guess you already all know it is the famous art, uh, artist. And also con continued to, to the Romanticism by Cezanne, and also we start to see some of the uh, examples that seem to apply this non-finite technique even nowadays. So like uh, probably um, the Sopranos, uh, the, the famous the drama, if you know, the, conclu the, the, the ending is very famous for the Sopranos not having any conclusion. So people start to came up with really a, a lot of uh, different ideas about what the conclusion means. And also the lower part actually it's from Netherlands. Uh, I don't know exactly which area it is. Uh, it's uh, cross, crossings having no traffic signals, uh, but the, there seems to be no accidents happening in, in this <laughs> place. So um, the, um, the much of non-finito uh, art pieces are very well appreciated by people, and also even nowadays um, the, when we apply this kind of um, idea of unfinishing certain part of it, it creates even more interesting experiences. So um, we try to define what are the, uh, the types of these um, non-finito products uh, in existing uh, kind of newly emerging artifacts and we identify three different types of um, the non-finito artifacts. The first uh, example, I mean first type of the non-finito artifacts are the products that are incomplete in conclusion, uh, by which we mean that there is no predefined or uh, predefined uh, consequences or endings of using this kind of product, which can be uh, uh, the well explained by the example like poke feature in Facebook. Uh, I assume everyone knows this uh, strange feature, but I don't think anyone uses it anymore. Uh, but anyway, so I think the POC feature is um, uh, the kind of um, good example for this type of um, non-finito products because the uh, sender of the POC uh, does not know what will be the consequences of sending this POC message. And also the uh, receiver of the POC also doesn't understand what it means. So she or he 
<laughs> he needs to <laughs> interpret the message by herself or himself. So the, in a way, the ending of the uh, conclusion of this using message is created and personally interpreted in very different ways, although this feature actually was not really successful in the case of Polk. Uh, and also the second type of the non-finite products are the products that are incomplete in content by which we mean that uh, we can make or create some kind of empty part, uh, missing part within a product. Uh, some simple example like this is the status message feature, the filling uh, out the status message in the SNS applications like uh, WhatsApp or KakaoTalk in Korea or Skype. And although it uh, this feature was probably originally intended to be using to post your status, uh, but we realized that actually, in, particularly in Kakaoto, not many people are using exactly posting their current status. It's used for many different ways. Sometimes they put some very important D-day, uh, how many D-day uh, days left, or uh, very meaningful proverb, uh, phrases or pro proverbs or quotations they want to follow and keep in mind in their living situation or some kind of requests they would like to post for their social network. So the usage, uh, use, the goal of using this was determined not by designers, but actually by uh, the end users. So by end user determining what, to, what this should be used for, it becomes a complete. <clears throat> In the uh, third type of the non finito products are the products that are incomplete in context, by which that the, um, we mean that there is no predefined fixed context the product should be installed or used. So uh, the product becomes a meaningful and complete by end users to decide which context and situation the product should be used for. So the example is like Twine, which is uh, the simple, uh, easy to make uh, sensor and actuator kits. Uh, so if we, even if you are using the same set of sensors, like for example, door sensor with uh, some kind of actuator, uh, if you put it on the entrance or if you put it on the table uh, drawer, that becomes a completely different applications and features. So the features are determined by the uh, end users uh, for this kind of the product. So we have realized that the, um, <coughs> by kind of providing this uh, well-constrained flexibilities, uh, by which we mean that we are not opening up everything determined by the users. We are actually uh, kind of a pro pro providing a uh, certain part of it missing and open, uh, which can be determined by the users. Uh, we can actually enable user creative creativity uh, effectively working for their personal ex experiences with using this kind of artifacts. Okay, so that was the first example that we tried, um, which we actually published uh, about two years ago at CHI, uh, which was non finito product. And the second one I would like to talk about is the, uh, our study about understanding user experience of DIY smart home, which, was also, which is also led by uh, another PhD student of mine, Jung Bam Woo. Um, he's also finishing his thesis now. Uh, I have actually wonderful PhD students. <laughs> uh, I'm lucky, <laughs> professor. I guess. Okay. So um, uh, we are um, the very much interested in the how people are experiencing this kind of a new type of uh, artifacts, like uh, do, doing yourself smart home kit, and what? How do they use it? How they are even de deciding? Uh, you know what kind of rules to create for their home. Uh, home environment and so on, and how to understand this kind of experience. So we uh, de uh, developed the, um, uh, we, we uh, the set up the uh, study with a kit of the Ninja Blocks, which was existing uh, commercial product for DIY smart home, although now actually they don't seem to produce them anymore, uh, combined with the Philips Hue, which is the smart light bulb, and we deployed that with a user diary for one month uh, for eight different families. And through this study, we discovered that the, uh, there is an uh, actually usage cycle that can be uh, understood as a pattern for uh, family members to use this kind of products. 
Uh, I will talk about this more detail shortly. But before then, let me uh, briefly show you an example the a participant of this study created. Uh, for him, he installed a door sensor in the uh, refrigerator door, like that. Uh, and uh, he made a rule that the, uh, when, whenever the uh, door is open and stand him himself, the mobile phone do not eat too much of a snack if it's after 9 p.m. So this kind of rule was the, create, uh, the, the rule created by the participants to help themselves uh, to improve their living situation. So um, if I briefly talk about the, the explain the usage cycle of DIY by smart home, um, it of course needs to start from initial installation of this DIY smart home kit. Uh, DIY smart home kit actually usually start to be used uh, in the existing, already existing home environment. So every family member, I mean households have their own different infrastructure of the home. So uh, DIY smart home kit should, we should make sure that it can be flexibly adjustable for different environments when we are helping them to install these kind of things. And after they successfully install this, um, it moves to the, the motivation phase, which is that uh, where actually people need to be motivated to come up with a new feature, I mean, new rule to uh, use for, uh, to be created with a DIY smart home to be used in their everyday living situation. Um, motivation is coming out usually when they identified or discovered any kind of problem uh, they have in their daily routines. So they decide to fix their problems using DIY smart home products. For example, another participant of uh, our study uh, realized that they often uh, wake, wake up. He often wakes up in the mid midnight and gets a drink of water in the kitchen and then it's hard to find the light switch so always like bump into the things that are hard to, um, uh, because it's a very dark uh, place. So he implemented um, this rule to be working through the DII smart home kit uh, like this. So use the motion sensor and flips you light bulb and when it gets uh, the dark, uh, and when someone is getting close to the kitchen, it open, you know, it you know automatically turns on the light. So this is the examples that people started to implement, and they, after they successfully implemented, they goes to the use through routine phase, through which actually they, they discover any errors or bugs or troubles of this kind of rules they they are using in their daily routines, and also sometimes they discover that it can be used for even, uh, it can be revised for some other uh, further extended uh, rules. For example, one of the mother uh, in a, on, on a household uh, the set up the rule uh, for her son to go, um, the, uh, I mean, indicating the time for the her son to go to school by changing the light color uh, in the morning time so that he do, she doesn't have to neck her son to really, uh, you should go to school and so on. Uh, she realized that actually, after setting up this rule, uh, she doesn't have to, you know, uh, give um, nagging uh, sound to her son, and the son actually goes to school uh, himself. And she liked this rule and extended to the uh, another uh, uh, rule for applying to her daughter uh, to uh, tell her that the, uh, I mean, show her that. Uh, it's go to the kindergarten, uh, and but uh, looks like uh, the son for son's case it worked out, but for daughter's case it didn't work out. But anyway, uh, uh, so this is how they are uh, revising and increasing um, rules over time. So they orchestrated uh, over a rules or together, uh, the created by different family members, and through this process, they also um, they uh, discuss with family members, communicate with family members, also resolving the any conflicts they have. Also, create that created another value for family members as well, not just uh, helping them uh, more convenient living situation. So the four dust rules that are successfully uh, utilized uh, in the used through routine phase go, normally goes to routinization phase. Uh, in the routinization phase, people um, 
realize that actually those rules they are they created are uh, already there. I mean, they don't feel like it's uh, it's uh, consciously there. So it becomes a part of their home and their living situation and organically settled into the place where they were needed. Uh, and also, of course, uh, they can, uh, uh, it goes to the remover, remover phase when rules are not anymore necessary to be used. Uh, or um, some rules uh, realize that they are not really working well when the phase of the use through routines, uh, people discovered that. So um, through this whole cycle, uh, we could understand the, uh, how DIY smart home actually um, is used in their family living situation and what kind of things we need to consider when we try to design this kind of thing. So uh, we also discovered that routines are really important resources for them to come up with a good ideas for uh, working for the DIY smart homes. So finally, I would like to mention that the uh, usage pattern of this kind of HCI 3.0 artifacts never stays in a fixed way, uh, and it continuously evolves over time uh, by actually not only just uh, users, but also artifacts themselves as well, also, uh, which are closely, they are evolving closely tied to people's everyday activities. So I think it connects to also previous uh, of presentations as well. So that's my talk today. Thank you. So I guess we should. Thank you. Okay. And we would like to invite uh, Oscar and Will to uh, and you to, to take a seat in the in the, the panel chairs. <laughs> I would like the audience to uh, think of questions that they could ask, um, and I will do the, the first question <laughs> to, to help you think. <laughs> I think what I learned from all three talks is that um, the word functionality is not going to be used any longer. Um, but. Um, when people ask you the question, um, what is this product for? What do you then answer? <laughs> yeah, actually, um, that, um, the, it's, it, I, to me, I think that the, uh, probably uh, the level of the purpose we can talk about uh, now is different. I mean, uh, for example, like a thermostat, example, like a nest, uh, what is it for? We used to tell that uh, it actually help us to set the certain temperature we like, but now it becomes like it's for saving energy. So to me, it's more like the goal, I, I mean the purpose, or what is it for? Uh, we start to think about different level when we think about this kind of artifact. So that seems to be first uh, kind of uh, difference. It, seems to be creating in my personal uh, yeah ID opinion um, yeah so I mean I would say that uh, in the context of, of I think a lot of the, the work that was presented in the first session um, and in my presentation too I think that it, 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 it there's multiple kind of outcomes here so on the one hand um, what is it for? What's the function? Uh, I mean, so I think that there's some clear like outcomes. So in the context of my own presentation, so like the, the photo box or like all, I mean, the, the, it's about opening up these different kind of resources and and making them accessible, but but thinking about a different way in which they get operated in everyday life. I mean, it's a configuring of the user that's one that is like inherently curious, creative. Um, and has their own autonomy to choose whether they want to engage with them or not. But also I think, you know, what is it for? It's also about creating, thinking about transcending functionality and thinking about is there a deeper relation that we can design these things for? So beyond just our relation to them, to them being just their functionality, being just their symbolic value, is there a way of, of, of looking at this kind of like, this, this the kind of the nature of the quality of the relation you need to this thing for it to persist in your life? Um, and I think as a design research community, it's about creating um, things that can that can help us start to surface up the higher level of, um, knowledge from making different kinds of artifacts. Um, I think that normally what I would say is like try it on and let me know, or take it home and give it a life, something like this. Mm. 
thanks for the very nice talks. I was wondering if uh, maybe we could discuss a bit about the materiality of the products to see what the links could be. And for the softness, I can imagine that you can only speak about that in terms of materiality. But if it's about slowness and unfinishedness, I had the impression that maybe it, it, it could add something to our understanding of the products if, if we would add also some understanding of the materiality. I was wondering if you could say something more about it. For instance, the photographs, the prints are material, right? It's different when it would show a picture on a screen and it would disappear again or something. So what does that do, that you can stick it on your wall, etc.? And also, uh, for instance, for, for the crossing, uh, that would, uh, there are no signs there, so you have to slow down. You, you could also make people slow down in a, in a different way with the speed bumps, or I've seen designs with little holes in the street for bikers who are texting that they get alarmed that there might be a traffic sign <laughs> coming up or something, right? So there are many ways in which you can be unfinished or in which you can be slow. Could you say a bit more about that? Um, yeah, well, I mean, just a, a quick response. I would say that um, the materiality, the material dimensions, I mean, these are things that we kind of almost inherently know how to relate to. It's something that we know how to, like, so easily manipulate, reform, reconfigure, change in relation to our lives. Um, and, and not that we can't do that with computational systems, but uh, there's an extra kind of, like, layer of, kind of, of mediation that can shape that that relation to the thing. And, and um, so in a very simple statement, I think that that's, that's one of the important reasons why we've kind of moved more into the material realm. Uh, and also, I, um, the interesting thing about the uh, material, materiality in relation to the uh, kind of non-finito type of product is that uh, many examples uh, that are, we think were successful uh, as an example, for non-finished products, they are actually very highly uh, finished. I mean, in terms of materiality, um, the, uh, they should be very easy to understand. And also, um, like actually, the examples um, the will show us the three of the examples all are very highly finished and materiality-wise, it's a very high quality. Uh, but they actually, because of the uh, the way that it's designed and the properties, also open up the uh, new interpretations and also new ways of thinking about them. So I think materiality plays a very important role for us to how to help people to uh, rethink about uh, the, the what this kind of artifacts can do and how we can relate to this kind of artifacts and so on. So materiality is definitely important. I don't know. I think that for me it's quite obvious, but uh, I would also like to um, to point to the work that one of our PhD stu students is doing, Pauline Vadongan, who works with the void, works with the emptiness as a way of also putting emphasis of, of what is next to it and how it can be filled. So that's also really interesting. I think that even if you leave things incomplete, incomplete doesn't have a bad connotation because that's the first thing that comes to your mind is like, oh, you forgot something. But it's the other way around. It's like there is a space, there's space for something else. And it's up to you to fill it in with a use, a, your body, a routine, whatever else you want to put in. It is interesting because it highly relates to uh, non-infinity uh, products where there's also some unresolved issues and an incompleteness which then needs to be filled in by the user themselves. Right. So I have a follow-up question to, to the question about materiality. I was struck, so that materiality is not dynamic, or mater I mean, sorry, materials are dynamic. Uh, they're, they're not static. We, they're, they're different states or different stages. I was struck. So you and I was struck in your presentation by the comparison between the, the door sensor, which is really a magnet, and the very expensive fridge. <laughs> very, very finished, uh, you know, incredible. I mean, I couldn't, I was like, there's a display through that stainless steel? Like, what are they doing there? But the contrast, bit of materiality. And then I was, Will, you were the loving detail over how you cut through that moss, you know, uh, covered log, and the drying, and the sanding. And then, of course, there's the, the, the finished, uh, uh, a slow game and, and, and Oscar that I think there was that slide you had of 
sometimes things start with a collection of things. I think there was like yarns, there was a sensor, there was a circuit. And that also has material. And, and, and I'm, so I'm curious, I mean, I suppose we could talk about, I don't want to talk about design process, but what I do like to hear you talk about is either the dynamics or the qualities of materials. And, and I was, they shift as well. That's not fixed. Um, yeah, so I would say that um, that that the qualities in the heroes are, are incredibly important, especially um, when. And this is actually kind of getting back also to, to, to Peter Paul's question too, um, where you know it's not just about the interaction with the thing. It's a, we're actually looking at something bigger. We're looking at kind of a lived with experience, which really transcends just interaction and, and encompasses many more things. And so. Um, by crafting like artifacts that have this sense of m materiality and, and these really intentional um, material choices that maybe project a sense of kind of longevity, durability, um, presence let, that can be interacted with, but also just richly lived with, um, was incredibly important to the, the process. Yeah, for me, it's it's a thing that um, I'm interested in what things do, but also how they do it, and I think that that's how they do it. That it's the most important part. I mean, like um, Patricia was talking about, like this, like cycling jacket that lights up, but it's how it lights up, and how, for example, water drops go on it and slide down and create some kind of uh, strange effect on it. That what that's for me what makes it special, and it's these little details, these changes that don't directly affect what you do with them, in terms of your end goal, but it changes your path till you get there, that it's really important. So in uh, my cases, um, the, when we think about the non-finitive products, uh, we didn't actually categorize the, uh, the things like uh, very raw materials like uh, Arduinos or you know, the, or the uh, breadboard and things like that as a part of non-finitive products. Uh, because um, the, the quality of materiality that they are providing is uh, completely, in a way, open, uh, and so the end users, actually, unless they really have an expertise to use that kind of things, a uh, hard time to access those things. So the, by making it actually um, more like a really a completed product, but uh, opening up uh, the space for new interpretation and new kind of uh, interaction to this kind of uh, product uh, made uh, different kinds of um, types of uh, design space for the product, the end user product. So I think the uh, materiality in that area is also different from raw materials, uh, materiality. So I think uh, materiality actually plays in many different levels. Okay, so I want to go back to functionality. <laughs> uh, so one question that you can ask, or I, actually I, I will ask, is if you look at these examples uh, through the lens of functionality, they all the functionality is pretty simple and pretty narrow and very specific in all three cases. So this type of work with the, that kind of all of you represent, is it? Is it only possible to do for very, very simple, specific functionalities? Or is this something that can also be expanded to? I mean, we have a lot of things where you can't, that you can't really take care of with simple functionality. It's very complex things, and we need systems and stuff to get things to work and connections and, you know, all that extra background stuff. And, what about that? Is, is this a very particular kind of objects and artifacts you're looking at that kind of has its own little world and it doesn't really expand or scale to other parts of our world? So um, I think that we are just showing the part that we did, the part that we, are, that we designed, but the rest, it's up to the society, it's part of the bigger system that's behind. So for example, we work on a pillow for quite a long time and we wanted to make it perfect. No, it should work for everybody, it should have the perfect use, the perfect interaction. It was for people with dementia, it was for people that we wanted them to get, give them sensory motor stimulation. And uh, it was together done with 
uh, caretakers, doctors, etc., 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 etc. So we want to try to make the perfect game, the perfect um, stimulation system. But we realize that everybody is different, that everybody wants to use it in a different way. So actually, the only thing we could do is to stay at the level of the sensory motor skills. So we stopped at the mapping. We stop at the mapping from uh, input and output. We try to work really nice interactions like scratching, pressing, uh, pulling. But then what we said is we left it open, open for the caretaker, open for the doctors to make it part of their system. So maybe as a pillow, it's super simple. It sounds even like useless, but uh, it's how people will appropriate it. It's how people will feel the emptiness that will give it its value. And then it will be way stronger than if we would have designed it all, if we would have closed the functionality. So we just made a pillow that if you scratch vibrates, but then people start using it as a, some kind of uh, mirror game. Because if I scratch here, you can also scratch there. Other people, they use it as a, almost like the snake game. So I scratch here and the other person goes along. Other people, they were just like putting their fingers on and fidgeting. I mean, people with dementia, they will get worse and worse and worse. So the only thing we wanted with this pillow is on one side track their development, but not development to get better, but... And the other one was to um, make sure that at least they can move a bit their fingers so the family thinks that the person is still there. Well, Eric, I would like to argue with you about your point. Um, because actually, I think that what we're talking about is complexity. And it's not about creating something that's very simple, that's narrowly defined, that only fits with a particular function. Actually, because creating things that fit within the complexity of everyday life is inherently a huge challenge, right? And I think that like one of the things that we're all collectively trying to do is um, create things that might have some, sen kind of some sense of fit, some sense of longevity, um, some way of achieving that within incredibly dynamic, changing, complex circumstances? Both of them answered. <laughs> so, yeah. Hi. So, I think a common theme, well, openness came back a few times, and I think that is very interesting and very much related to things that we are interested in uh, in Eindhoven. Um, but it came to very different degrees in your, your talks. For example, in William's case, it was very much an openness in interpretation, while your narrative was quite uh, strict in how I'm supposed to use it and what pictures are printed. With Oscar, it was like the art, how do I take it? Uh, what do I do? What role does it have for me? What use do I have? And in the case of Interaction 3.0, it was like, OK, uh, you have tools to make something different, but it was much more open. So my, my question is, how, what is the right openness for different cases? How do I know as a designer how much openness is appropriate for this complex you know, context that you're targeting? How do I know if it's a success or not in the end? Um, for me, it's the moment that you don't know anymore what you're doing. So the moment that you don't know anymore what you're doing, it's the moment that you should stop. And it's the moment that you say, maybe someone else should be responsible for deciding what to do with it. But then, just give Lego bricks, nothing else. No, but what I mean, with the pillow, for example, we, we made this, and you know, because you, you also know about the project, um, at the beginning, we did really wanted to have games and things like this. But then we were like, okay, who are we to decide which games people want to play? Uh, who are we to decide the way that a family should talk to each other in a personal and intimate matter? So that was the moment that we said, okay, okay, this is, uh, uh, this is too much. So I think that there's a moment that you feel already that you are making a, a, a too much, a jump that it's too big, that you are already starting to play God in a way. And that's the moment that you should really stop. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so following from Oscar's point, I think that I would respond is you'll never know. Like, you'll never know ahead of time. It's not like a predetermined thing. I think that, you know, one of the things that I think is an advantage of design and design research is that it's piecemeal. So you are kind of going through a process of like making, figuring things out about the world, you know, trying to strike that and develop a sensibility for how much is too open and how much is too restraining. I mean, 
um, in, in several of these projects, we had these very romantic notions that it would only do something like once a month, and that would be great because it's so poetic. And it's like, well, it doesn't turn out, that's not right. And so it was a process of kind of working with the thing, living with it, and, 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 and through that process, you develop a sensibility. And also, in a way, um, this kind of approach makes the designers uh, more humble. I mean, in terms of that we don't know the answer uh, uh, to the people and trying to empower more of the uh, end users rather than the designer herself, himself, try to, uh, you know, push certain things to end users. Um, but I think uh, in terms of the practical uh, side. I think we should research further on the, what is the really uh, the good quality of openness. Definitely, I think we need to, as our design researchers, further explore and also trying to make uh, more cases and trying to see uh, how that works and also understand um, the which works uh, more meaningfully for people. Uh, so I'll go back to this um, notion of experience. Um, if, if in product design we are we are having this discussion about moving away from um, pro, um, from problem solving, away from need, away from function, um, uh, and maybe if we frame it about more uh, about experience or an, or an um, an experience design. Uh, is not the role of what um, we are moving towards is the creation of value rather than need. And if that is the case, what is the relationship of the projects that you're talking about in terms of the way that we reduce the cognitive overhead of technology? And is that important in terms of the way that we are able to create value as opposed to a, a predisposition towards need? I think that's a really good question. Um, so I, I would say that that yeah, that it, is it is it about need? Is it about value? You know, or is it problem solving? I mean, to me, the, like, when I think about the work, actually, we're all actually trying to engage with a grand problem. It's a huge problem. It's how how do we create tech? Te technology or computational things that can be woven into our lives, that can be a part of our lives. And, and, and so, you know, we can kind of isolate these things. We can say, well, well what's, what's the need for that? Or what's the function of that? And, and what, what is that going to do? And who would buy that? But really, the, the, the thing that we're doing, I think, is, is that we're trying to create this, this um, surface, this provisional knowledge from, from the ground up through, through, through making these things. And, and so it's really, we can look at them in isolation, but it's, it's as, as we start to kind of look at them together, we can start to see um, what might be more viable strategies for these grand problems of like, how can we create things that could be a part of our lives for a long period of time where technology tends to always fail? Um, and so for me, that doesn't quite scale to, to, to need and, and value as much as um, it's a mode of inquiry into a, a grand challenge. <laughs> so um, I actually fully agree with what Will mentioned. And um, to me that uh, this kind of uh, new, the new types of artifacts also uh, open up the uh, end users to um, have, I mean, the achieve the values in different ways from the traditional artifacts. And um, I'm not sure, although I, and I don't know whether the, uh, the example like uh, Airbnb it can be uh, also, I think it can be also an uh, example for the HCI 3.0 artifacts, which uh, completely is, has a different kind of uh, the business model uh, comparing to the existing uh, hotel business. And uh, actually, every end user can become a service provider at the same time also experiencing the service uh, as well with Airbnb. So I think that the new kinds of um, Mm, you know, value achievement is happening with this kind of uh, new artifacts. So I think that those are also interesting areas to think about as well as designers. Yeah, I don't know. For me, it's, it's really difficult to talk about value and experience. Um, I think that for me, what I want is to make, th that's another word that you shouldn't use, but anyway, to make things meaningful. Um, I think that this long term, like make things that you will continue using even if there's a new one. 
And it's not about making something that feels better because sometimes it could be the other way around. I mean, there's a lot of uh, things that it's, it's meaning or it's using your life. It's because actually they scratch and they make your skin actually in the long term more healthy. So uh, um, I don't know, I think this, this shift from product to, to sh uh, form, function, experience, emotion, pleasure, and who knows what else came after, I don't know what is it taking us. I think that um, I think that all these projects are also a bit of trying to shake this a bit and find out what else is there. That's what I wanted to say. Um, thank you for all the talks. Um, I'm actually happy that the, in the last question the problem-solving aspect has been introduced because yeah, we're dealing with all these complex questions and problems and the very like, specific context that we are designing for, but it's open and it's in, in unfinished in a way and incomplete. Might it have to do in some way, I'm not we're sure if this is the right way of phrasing it, but might it be that we are shifting the problem solving inside the design process and the design experience that we originally were making problem, um, projects and products just to solve problems that but in a sense that because these problems become bigger and bigger and more complex and more diverse and more individualistic in a way, might it have to do with the fact that we are moving the problem solving to something that's uh, the user's act and that we created uh, products that can be covering values and thus in a way the problems of users, but let them be open to do so. so is there, do you think that there might be a shift in where the problem solving in the process is actually happening? So actually, yeah, that's exactly what we are seeing right now. And also with example like a DIY smart home, problem solving activities were happening in the end user side. So they were discovering the problem they want to solve and they actually developed their own strategies to solve the problems utilizing those uh, uh, sensor kits. And it actually, in because of that, it kind of uh, uh, naturally served uh, the, um, the, that the, uh, every family member Every family has their own different problems to solve and own different, you know, the cultures and the living styles and those we cannot actually try to, you know, predefine uh, with our um, the designs that we are designing. So, yeah, that was what we observed actually. Um, I mean, maybe even framing the nature of the work as problem solving is, is problematic. I mean, maybe maybe there, these are problems that will never be solved. I mean, I think that that what a lot of the, the work that we're talking about here is is um, trying to grapple with this this deeper issue of, of how humans relate to things and how technology fits into that, and whether that will ever be solved. Maybe isn't even the, the most interesting way of framing it. Maybe it, it's um, it's kind of an ongoing thing that we're struggling with. But maybe we'll be able to make progress by having a diver diversity of um, design approaches. Yeah, for me, I think that the balance between designers and society changed, and it changed also because products are not just glasses that I touch. They're way bigger in terms of uh, what they permeate. So by having a bigger scale, um, just being an expert on making a, a glass, it's not enough. And you need someone who's an expert on the rest. And the rest is people's life. And you need to get them in if you want to make something. That's, that's for me, it's a question of that, it's the, scale, the scaling up, this bigger picture required, and that you can't really imagine how everyone will do things. You can't really imagine how people will use all these uh, applications. So I think it's also a bit of accepting that designers are not God anymore, that they're not going to solve people's life. They are just one object more in the chain of relations. OK, thank you for uh, changing our uh, mindsets, perhaps not our skills, but our mindsets to uh, the complexities of every day. Um, there are also everyday rules, and one of the rules is that at 12.30 um, we're going for lunch. So I want to thank the speakers for this beautiful first morning, and I want to ask you to go to lunch.